Welcome to episode 11 now of the Estate 2 podcast. If you're already noticing a difference in the sound quality. Does it sound really nice? It sounds rich. Mellow, yeah. Listen to that. You'll probably hear my stomach rumbling in about 10 minutes as well. No, it won't pick it up. True, yeah. Directional. Yeah. For the listeners, tell them, tell them what we're talking about. Basically, I just needed to spend some money before the end of the tax year and I just bought three mics. <laughs> and I've always wanted some of these, haven't I? I've been pushing them since Gone day on one. F- uh, yeah, about it for weeks. Let's address the elephant in the room, or the second elephant <laughs> in the room. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? Um, we have a guest on t- this week's episode. Ed, hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the yeah. show. Ed is a... What are you, Ed? I'm who, a, who are you and what are you? I'm a, a writer and director. I'm, <laughs> I'm Ed Kirk and I'm a writer and director. We've brought you on this week, haven't we? In yes. light of the release of your debut feature film. Yeah, so um, I've got a, a film coming out. It's called Future Soldier and it's going to be streaming everywhere. Um, I imagine yeah. it's out now, right? Yeah, probably when this release is out. Yeah, yeah. So it's out now. Future this normally has a, it's probably out, out last year. <laughs> yeah, by the time around. we get this out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's my it's my first feature as writing director. Yeah, and uh, I'm here to talk about it. You are indeed. What have you been watching recently, Jared? We'll come back to Ed in a second. Okay. <laughs> I've got news um, for you. That's all. I oh have you yeah but you go first I'm building high oh, I mean okay well now whatever I say is just gonna look shit it's just filler don't worry about it okay right <laughs> I watched Top Gun Maverick at last last you've week. seen it before though haven't you no I've not what watched it when think? it came out loved it yeah it's brilliant, really good it? yeah I watched the first one when Top Gun Maverick came out in the cinemas <laughs> why, why? <laughs> because thinking I'd go to the cinemas and watch right, Top yeah, Gun Maverick sure. so I watched it and I did really enjoy the original with the mindset that it's like, if I watched this when it first came out, this would be incredible. Yeah. But watching it, obviously, it's a little dated. It's a bit cheesy. I couldn't and get through it. It's a bit too 80s for me. I tried I had Danger it. Zone in my head for about three weeks. Yeah. More yeah. my aviators wherever I went. <laughs> I went back home the other weekend and we watched Top Gun Maverick and I was just like in awe of like how certain scenes are shot. It's just so good, isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah. I loved it. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the first one, though. I really like the first one. And then... Um... I cut my bit out where I said it was two <laughs> 80s then. <laughs> that out. I love the first one as well, actually. Um, yeah. I, 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 I... Why were we both like that then? <laughs> That's why I drink <laughs> Shiloh. <laughs> no, I love the first one, but I, I really enjoyed Maverick as well. I think Maverick is, if you made the first... Like, you took the DNA of the first one and made it now. It's like a proper modern version of that film. Yeah. The visuals is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Everything yeah. in the cockpit is just... Yeah. Ollie awesome. made a great point. I spoke to him the other day and he was saying how the, the route that they take, you know, how, how they're training for the route to make sure that they they can get the, the velocity and stuff, how that was drilled into our heads without spoof feeding. So you knew where they were at which point. Yeah. He said he loves that. And it's yeah. like, actually, yeah, that's a very good point rather than like either not knowing what's going on or how important or how dangerous a mm. certain bit of that course. Yeah, that's a great point. Really. Is. But yeah, really good. What about you? Have you watched anything? Well... Here we go. Last night. Strap yourselves in. Finished Ugly Valley. <laughs> finished I season mean, four. That's we only been one end. episode. Because you mentioned it in episode 10. So you must have. Yeah, but we did that about a month them. ago. We, <laughs> we, we don't tell them that. We didn't binge it. Yeah, finished Ugly Valley. It was pretty emotional. Is the ending satisfying for the four seasons? Because I, I try not to watch TV unless I know the ending is going to be good. It's not disappointing. That's good. It's yeah. not like some of the, the shows that have kind of ran for that long and then had disappointing endings. Yeah. What about you, Ed? You I anything? have been watching uh, The Last Kingdom on Netflix. They're releasing a film to finish it. So I thought I'd, I'd watch, I'd catch up before the film yeah. releases. That's on my list to watch, actually. Cause it, was it kind of after Game of Thrones that was a bit inspired I think by so. that style? Yeah. Um, the setting's pretty good, though, because it's Vikings, but it's pre- is it like it's Saxons and Vikings? So it's it is a bit different to like Vikings or yeah. whatever. It, it it feels quite fresh. Shall we just get straight into the main reason you yeah. visited for the day? Yeah, sounds um, good. So your new film, your upcoming film, Future Soldier. Do you want to inform the viewers a quick overview of what the film's about? Sure. So um, have you practiced this, or is this the first time? This is this is the first time. Yeah. Uh, so it's set in the year two thousand and two. It's the future. Um, it's a cyberpunk dystopian metropolis c- that covers all of Europe called Super City Europe. And uh, a retired bounty hunter slash 
ex super soldier comes out of uh, comes out of retirement um to solve uh, a really sprawling conspiracy um Ooh. and that yeah that, that's kind of all i'll say but uh but yeah it's a it's a sci-fi action movie why are you here harrington i'm still alive and i know about everything work for me mo one last Lights healed faster than regular people. This is your first feature length, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Um, and it started out as a short, didn't it? Yeah, so Future Soldier is based on a short film called Hot Plight 2000, which I made when I was at uni. There's quite a lot of differences between the short and the feature. Um, a lot of that is tone. Obviously, it runs three times as long and the scale's bigger and, and all of that sort of stuff. But uh, Is that a decision that you chose to make or is that something that just naturally had to be done in terms of because you went from a short to a feature, the tone had to change? No, it, it didn't It didn't need to change tonally, um, but that was a decision we made really early on. So when, when we made the short film Hop Light 2000, um, I did a lot of world building. So whether that comes across in the actual short, I don't know, but it, it was all a lot of stuff that I kind of thought about. So um, it's uh, building the backstory of the characters a little bit it was building the kind of dystopian corporate future and i felt like there were more stories to tell in this setting but not necessarily in the same way we wanted to do something really specific with the short so i wanted it to be like a kung fury-esque bit tongue-in-cheek kind of pastiche of, of those 80s action movies that's what i wanted to do i, I you know I, I said oh i want to make a short film that that is a homage to 80s action movies and is a bit wink at the camera. And I didn't want to do that again. I didn't feel like that that wasn't the direction the story was going to go in. Because I, yeah. I, I, I felt like, what what more did I have to say with that tone? I wanted to tell a more serious science fiction story. So some of the tropes are the same and yeah. the world's the same and the characters are, are similar. But I, I did want to kind of reinvent the world and the story and, and tell a, a fresh kind of fr- fresh narrative. Did you carry anyone across from that then? So from the short film, did you have any cast and crew that kind of came back for the feature? All the cast returned. Um, their character, some of the characters are quite different. In in the, you know, they all they all play the same characters, but some of their characters that we approach differently when I approach differently when writing it. But yeah, the whole cast came back, um, which is which was really nice because it was nice working with these people again. It was wor- working with the actors again and and working with them to develop this kind of new tone of voice and 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 the new way we're approaching the characters if that makes sense so um that was really nice and some of the crew returned um my dop ben colin returned um which was great and some people returned a bit in different capacity so we had some people who helped out on the shoot who then just did vfx and 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 stuff like that so yeah it was about kind of seeing where we were two years after we'd made the short film and figuring out what worked well and and how you know where where people would be best suited and and who was available to do it because not everyone was you know people people's lives moved on so it was about figuring out like where are we two years later and working to everyone's strengths i think that's a nice testament though that people did return and it shows that you must have done something right with a set of the the first one how did it compare with the the set from the short film to the feature film was there a lot more pressure did people know that like the stakes had been raised for me personally, I think there was more pressure because because of the scale and because we've decided to take this it's something that that we've done on a smaller scale and then, and then gone up to a feature. A lot of that was how we approached the individual scenes. I think I wanted the performances in the individual scenes to to be really strong, and I wanted I wanted to approach each scene both separately and as part of the wider film because I, I, that was something that I really took away from the short. I wanted the film to really flow. I wanted to kind of flow between the scenes, and I wanted to make sure that all the scenes kind of work together rather you know i wanted i didn't want it to feel disjointed in any way i wanted to feel feel like um you know the film was a was was consistent and there was no point going back if it wasn't going to be better so yeah. that was a that was something on our mind we wanted to really raise raise the stakes when we were doing this shoot um because it was you know there was a lot more people the cast was much bigger and the you know the scope and the set pieces were bigger and we really wanted to deliver <laughs> Ed, if you could just give us a quick overview of the, the the time it took to film Future Soldier. Yeah, so uh, we we 
initially shot in 2019 in Jan- in January 2019 um and it was a two week shoot so i think it was 14 days but it might have been 16 i, I can't remember mm-hmm. um i wrote the film in 2018 and then it spent the last few years in post so it's been it's been a, a long process i think it's probably 5 years all all in all from start to finish and we didn't shoot any pickups or anything it was all just one block that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Not to have pickups. Yeah, because we've That's we've done time. a few, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> I know, <it's> like, <laughs> um, did you feel like you did need pickups at any point, or like did you feel like you you were confident with what you got to make? Because we obviously filmed stuff and was like, it might just need this mm. just to give a bit more context or a little, you know, a little bit of something else. But were you completely happy with that, or did you decide not to? Whether it was budget, whether it was getting people back again considering it's been so long since that initial period of filming there was a couple of scenes that we we dropped because i didn't feel like they worked mm. um and maybe we we could have done a pickup for some of that but i i do think you know luckily it, it has made the story more streamlined with some of those scenes dropped so that was nice we've not actually touched on that in terms of removing scenes because we've spoken about pickups in the past haven't we to, you yeah. know to make the story fuller and better whereas like actually removing scenes We've not spoken about that in the past, but it's good to know that just because your script says this, 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 and this, yeah. when you get into the edit room, it doesn't all need to be there in order for the film to make sense. Some of the lack of pickups was budget. Like It was very much, you know, I, I knew when we were on set that there wasn't going to be enough money to film anymore. So it was like, let's get it right now and and work with what we've got. And then, yeah, some stuff did get dropped, which which was good. And I think some of that might play down, might come down to the the way it was written. Originally, I wrote it as six, 10 minute episodes. So some of the stuff that got dropped were scenes that were the final scenes of some of those episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, so they worked better in an episodic format. Yeah. But when I got into draft two and, and went from six, 10 minute scripts to one feature length script, um, some of those things carried on and it just so happened that those those scenes were the ones that got dropped. So that was actually quite nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and it streamlined some of the character arcs. Uh, there, there was a scene in particular where one of the characters has a, a scene where it's just them and it it, it does complicate their arc. Um, it, it, it's a bit, it makes their story arc a bit more murky. And I, and I think, you know, we, we got into the edit and some of those things got cut and some of those things got shifted around. So some scenes got, you know, their position in the film got changed and that just helped make the final film work work as best as it could do. What was the turning point from your six 10 minute episodes? And what was the turning point from that to go in, actually, this needs to be a feature? Um, so, I mean, we got 60 pages and I was like, I need to write another 15 more and it's a feature length script. Yeah. Um, which sounds you know, it sounds quite cynical, but it, we, I'd accidentally written a feature, basically. All the, you know, the additional content ended up being the flashbacks mm. that underpin the entire film. So I think by like draft three or four, like it became very clear that all the flashbacks were thematically really important to the to the modern day sort of story but but yeah that you know i'd written 60 pages and you know me and my dop kind of kind of talked about it and it was like can we can we develop this a little bit more and tell a feature length story Mm. Um, and i think it works much better as a feature i really i really do so we have a recurring weekly segment because we're still yet to have a sponsor so we have a shout out instead just as you know second best thing to do isn't it i think it's it's number one best thing to do actually i think the the shout outs are more important than the sponsors right, i think okay. the listeners are number one for us jordan not the money we're not doing it for that right okay it's the i'm just going to export this bit out for future reference when we're on podcast 56 and there's a sponsor every 10 minutes into the show and we're like use the code hello fresh for- <laughs> <laughs> just get in touch with them i need hello fresh i'm not gonna lie it's meant to be pretty good or squarespace they seem to sponsor everything i'm, I'm good for a website raid shadow legends what? <laughs> yeah, Raid Shadow Legends. You they sponsor everything, don't they? Yeah. yeah. You've oh, not heard yeah. of Raid Shadow Legends. You must. Do you pay for YouTube Premium? No. Oh. I'm no. amazed that you've not heard of Raid Shadow Legends. I don't think I have. Raid Shadow Legends, if they sponsor us, they might make like us into a character in the game. They've done that before with people. Never played it, though. Does yeah, it? we have. It's, we played it's the it number one time. RPG <laughs> real RTS game on mobile. <laughs> <laughs> so, in lieu of a sponsor, we have a shout out. Um, and whenever we have a guest, we like to pass on the opportunity to give for, for you to give a shout out. Anyone who you want to shout out, whether it's you know, or... not Callum, <laughs> um, but is there anyone in particular that you are, you know, 
appreciative of, thankful for, who you just want to shout the name out to, really. Yeah, so uh, I said, I've got two. Um, <sighs> We've never had we two got, before. What do we do in this case? I don't know. Do them both and we'll maybe cut one out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pick a name out of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'd like to give my... my First shout out, which I'll not say first if you couldn't one. I'd like to give my uh, I'd like to give my shout out to uh, my DOP Ben Collin, who um not only was um there throughout pre production, he shot he shot Future Soldier and then he then did two years of visual effects, which I can never repay him for. So I would like to Well, to this a... starts, I think. This shout out starts repaying him. So there you go. Yeah, yeah there so, we go. Um, You're even now. And then uh, I'd I'd just like to just say that i'm really really grateful for my the rest of my cast and crew as well and everyone who kind of supported me and put up with me talking about this film for the last five years so uh so yeah big shout out to just everyone to everyone to everyone but more importantly ben yeah (laughs) (laughs) in terms of the shoot then so you said it was 14 days was that 14 days straight was that spread out or it was 14 days straight. Oh, my um, God. That's brutal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So... Um, How are you feeling on day, like, 12? <laughs> um, I think it was fair to say that we were all pretty knackered. Um, for for me to get it done, like, it was like now or never, or that, you know, that we can't come back, so we've got to do it. For me, that carried that carried me through. Um, we were all kind of staying in the same same house, so it was... It was quite a it was quite a unique kind of environment for for the shoot, um, which I look back on really fondly. On a typical shoot day, how many people would there have been on on a set? You know, what was the what was the typical crew size? So it, the crew size was was probably about between ten and fifteen people um, a day. Sometimes had a producer on set, and then we had at least one AC. And then you have the cast and, and crew, and there's, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big cast, um, yeah. and there was extras on some days. So, so most of the time, it was probably about ten people. Um, I mean, it was micro budget film, so you know we had to double up with some of the roles. Yeah. Um. So you had the first AC working as an AD as well, and then some people were scheduled in while we were filming other stuff. So it, it, depending on what day it was, the crew was either you know ten or fifteen people, and some stuff didn't need a big crew. Some stuff you know didn't need. You know, we didn't have a costume person every day, so so I did a lot of the I did I did some of the costume stuff throughout the rest of the shoot because you know certain people kind of get certain time of work to help, and so it, yeah. it was you know if if something didn't happen, it kind of fell on the core crew to kind of pick up the slack, and you know myself included really. So um yeah, so yeah, it was it was scrappy, but I, I that that was part of the charm, and I think you can see that in the in in the film. I think the film feels like you know we've we've tried to put a lot together with not a lot of of resource, so um. I think you learn a lot though as well when you're having to do multiple roles, you know, whether that's across different days or on the same day, but the amount you learn on a crew or on a set and a shoot of that size, you learn a lot. And what was your biggest takeaway point on set filming? What would you say you learned? What would you what did you take away the most from being a director on a feature set for the first time? I mean, it's a massive logistical undertaking and I think it really hammered home for me how you have you know filmmaking is where you have the creative side and you have the kind of a logistical side and it's where that meets you actually make the film it was a real crash course in you know figuring that out because i i I planned the majority of the shoot so i did did the core shoots for the majority of the shoot and worked out the logistics and it was you know a real crash course for the scheduling because i i I did i think at least eight or nine days of the scheduling to to start with um, and before before we started that was challenging but that that's really helped me grow as a filmmaker and understand how how you actually make things i think sounds really important I, that, that's something that i learned on this set um anson who's who's the uh who was the location mixer he his approach to sound really opened my eyes to how you can approach it and how how you know how much work goes into the sound um sound does make a lot of films fall short and at you know at low budgets and that was something that that that's you know i really i now really consider when making stuff we get told that a lot at uni don't worry it's like you know don't underestimate the importance of sound. And like, yeah. you know, when I was there, I'd be like, yeah, all right, okay, yeah, we'll leave that to someone else. You know, yeah. like, I want to, I just want it to look good. When actually, yeah, we've said about it, we've spoken yeah. about it in the past of like, yeah. if you've got really nice visuals on camera, but the sound is shit. People it, won't watch it. No. People won't watch it. No. That was really eye-opening. Um, Did you enjoy and appreciate this? Because it was a block film of 14 days whatever it was because we spoke to ollie on previous episode because that was a little bit more split up and 
obviously doing one block versus separate, you know, separating the blocks, they both have their own perks and mm-hmm. disadvantages. Did you like being in this box for two weeks solid and just being in like autopilot director mode and, you know, you'd never taken a week out and then having to get back into that mindset when you step back on set a month later or whatever. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think, I think that, that really made it easier for me. I think I would, I would have struggled to do a week and then go out and then come back in. I think for me, the the block worked much, much better. And that was headspace, I think. And it was, you know, you're working with everyone and you kind of get your groove on. And I think to stop and start that would be challenging, um i i guess the, the downside for that is you know you, you've got two very intense weeks um but i think for for headspace and that attitude of like we're here we may as well do it that was really good for, for me personally i think you can see how it all fits together a bit better if you do a block like that yeah you can feel how the scenes are starting to fit together and you can see the whole film sort of come together um in one sitting so by the end of it you know i knew we'd shot the film um i i I didn't i wasn't probably why i didn't need pickups well yeah well potentially yeah um but i think i think part of that is also seeing how it evolves as you go so i i really believe that you know you write the script then you make the film and then you edit the film and then all the different versions of the film in your head or the ones that you've shot straight and it's in the can and and you haven't edited anything yet or when you've you know, got your first draft i think all of it is in service of the final film i think that you know that final product mm. and i think it is a constantly evolving thing until you hit your final export and then you're done sort of thing and um, as we were kind of rejigging things and figuring out how things were going to work a bit better and flow a bit better in that two week slot we were kind of doing that and we were in it all the time and and i think that that helped um kind of moving on i, I can I, i'll just loop back if that's all right and just say about one of the things that we i learned yeah this production really hammered home how important collaboration was and how working with your crew, how important working with your crew is. I don't pretend to know everything um, and sometimes anything. Um, sorry, I, I don't. Pret- <laughs> that's going in. Yeah, that's, yeah, that in. yeah, carry on. <laughs> the people I worked with on the crew were were fantastic, and the the cast and the crew were fantastic. And it was about problem solving. Every location, it was about problem solving and working with them was an amazing experience because they they brought such a level of dedication to the different you know sequences and working out how things were going to work w- with people of with such talent was 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 really fantastic I, you know i couldn't have done it without them some of the sequences are much better than what i had planned because when i worked with these people who were so talented and we worked together i think that is where the real the real good stuff happens i think getting the right people into them roles is a massive part of it so that you can kind of trust them to do their jobs mm. so i think a lot of people when they're starting out think the director needs to come up with all of the answers and all of the ideas where it, it's really not like that at all you've got to curate everyone else's ideas and contributions towards your vision but you don't have to come up with everything yourself and i remember on among the living on one of the first shoot days i think it was the first shoot day it was a flashback scene i'd kind of storyboarded it prepped it and everything and i was like this is what it's going to look like and shooting one of the one of the scenes, George, you came up with an idea. It was like, oh, why don't we get this shot here? And I was like, Is this Emma in the bathroom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you remember it? Yeah. yeah. I was like, No, nah, I don't think we use it. I don't think we use it. And then he's like, Well, we've got time. I said, All right, let's get it. Why not? To make me happy. To make like, yeah, just yeah, to please him. Really like, that's naff. We're not using that. And then in the <laughs> edit, it's there. It, we used it. I was like, That's a great idea. Yeah. And it's just about curating it and working out. Does, is the idea good? Does it work? Does it fit into the vision of the film? If so, go for it. You know, you, you don't have to be precious about not having come up with the idea yourself. You know, just mm. go for it. We, we just wanted that scare impact yeah. of the, the head twisting. Well, you, you know, wanted the, it. It was your idea. Well, yeah, I true. wasn't going to yeah. have it. I was going to have <laughs> it. It was the from, over shoulder, wasn't it? That we yeah, got from I, I was going from Dean's, oh, from Harry's perspective, looking in and seeing it and then slam the door and everything. And it was George's idea. And actually, it works so well. And, yeah. and that looking Thank up... You. This is the only praise you get. In this after <laughs> we're never going to talk about it again. again. <laughs> we're never talking about this again. But that shot with the with the like the black eyes and mm. the the blood coming out and everything it works so well. Yeah. That coffee was really nice, George. Was it a good yeah, one? Thanks, Just small yeah. cups, really, isn't it? Well, you know, Just small mugs. Just cherish every like you get mouthful. Half a, half a portion. <laughs> don't want to vent you next time. <laughs> or do you want to vent your anger at me? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, I like that. Thank yeah. you. So let's talk. A little bit about you see how I dodged the uh, the cup Sorry, there. Yeah, uh, let's talk a little bit about. Just want to pat yourself on the back for that, John. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> just, how good you are! Can't reach because of these chuffing microphones. <laughs> um, 
yeah, let's talk a little bit about the locations in the film and the the costume design because those two things for me when watching it are like you know they stand out parts of the film, especially for you know a micro budget feature alongside the CG. But the locations that you'd got looked great. In terms of those locations, did you know they existed before? you started writing the script or did you find them afterwards because they fit so well where at which point did you know that those are the locations that you're going to choose and use well um well first first i hope the directing stands out as well of course uh, yeah, yeah. yeah i was just about <laughs> to say that <laughs> starting from the jordan yeah, 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 yeah. um it all comes back to world building um so when writing the script i knew that we could get some industrial locations somewhere to fill some of the locations yeah. um which sounds like a bit of a backwards way of doing it but I didn't have an, a distinct, specific location in mind for, I don't think, any of the locations. I think I had an idea of kind of what I wanted. And a lot of the locations are industrial. Um, you know, it's corrugated iron, it's exposed brick, it's pipes, it's all of that stuff. Mm. Um, uh, because I, kn- I knew we couldn't build that. So for a lot of it, um, I didn't have a specific idea in my head for what the locations were going to be. O- obviously, you know, you've got the, like the corporate offices have got a, a specific look and uh, the main character's apartment has a specific look, but the rest of it is like warehouses, scrapyards, all that sort of thing. Um, and I wasn't too precious about it. So if something did need to change, I wasn't precious about it. It would be like, okay, well, we're filming this in a in a, in a a car garage now or we're filming this in a warehouse or we're filming this in, in a corridor that's attached to the warehouse and printed yeah. somewhere else sort of thing. Um, and, and it was just about piecing together what would work for what. So um, a lot of the locations were I, I hadn't seen before. There was a car park I knew of and that that features in the film and the rest of it is stuff that i've kind of went out and found so we're very lucky to be able to hire some warehouses Mm. um and they provided the backdrop for a lot of the different locations um and then we look i looked at other you know industrial locations such as like a mechanics or scrap yards that were around where we were based um and it was kind of kind of just figuring out how all the pieces would fit together because it didn't really matter where specifically where one location was set yeah what i was more concerned of was the the consistent feel of the world i wanted all of the world to feel you know uh like it's part of the same universe it's part of the same city it's part of the same environment and that is this kind of industrial military cyberpunk retro future you know we we, we brought some old computers and we put them in the background and that kind of helps to to, to build it together but i, I could never build the locations as sets so when i was writing it i was like how can we take an industrial location like a barn or a warehouse or a garage and and where does that where can that fit in and how does that work because it doesn't matter at the end of the day doesn't it i don't think it matters to the story exactly where somewhere is set because a lot of it is kind of it does feel this the similar it feels consistent to me the cinematography and the lighting played a big part in fusing all those locations together you know whether you've got the, the tube lighting in the background and the neon light and mm. just hitting as a catch light those to me it helped with that illusion that it's in the same world which you know kudos to ben and whoever was you know helping with lighting and stuff on the day and camera because yeah to, i think that played a big part it felt consistent didn't it across yeah. all the locations like you could you could have argued that it was all set on one big complex and yeah i'd have believed you for sure yeah so yeah yeah kudos like you say and a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff was where one location was doubling as another one mm. um but we did want to feature a lot of practicals we wanted to f- make it feel real um because we were aware that we had we, you know, we had a micro budget and some of the things that we'd done with the short we definitely didn't want to repeat so it was this idea of we wanted to put practicals in we wanted to make it feel gritty and real and textured and all those things sort of built the the kind of the really kind of depressing dystopian future that that the, the film set in um so those were all decisions that were kind of made uh, early on, but I want I was I allowed myself to be flexible when booking the locations and figuring out what was going to work for what. Um, Which yeah. is what I've been strung up on in the things that I've been wanting to create for so long, where I've got such an image in my head of what I wanted to look like. That's probably hindering me from moving forward and actually making it because I've not found the perfect place yet. And that perfect place might exist, but they might not not let you have it. Yeah. So it's 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 just looking at what you've got and just seeing how it would work for the film and how the film would work for it. And maybe you need to change some things or maybe it works perfectly, but I, I allowed myself to be a bit more flexible and focus on the story we're telling and the world we're building rather than like, oh, I wanted a very specific location for this specific scene. 
I know. Take no know. Jordan. Take no. <laughs> We're shooting that film this week, aren't we? Uh, it was last Tuesday. <laughs> it was last yeah. Tuesday, yeah. yeah, yeah. Looking good. Right location. So let's move on to, a, Do you, have you got a question in mind about the costume or do you just want to talk through it? I was going to ask about the fight scenes. What shall we ask? What are the costumes in... You know? <laughs> Did they wear clothes in the film? <laughs> not, not in my case. Maybe That's stick into like the 80s theme. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So as part of building this whole world that obviously doesn't exist in, in real life, costume is obviously going to play a part in that. What did you incorporate in terms of costume to make this world feel even more real? It all goes back to the world building. So we wanted to build this dystopian future, this you know this this kind of Blade Runner esque world. And I worked with uh, Tom Love, who was the costume designer, to help flesh that out. Um, you know, individual characters wear costumes that reflect their characters, but also the part of the world they're from. So we've got people who live in the city streets, and we wanted to really layer their costumes so it felt practical it felt you know they're, they're protected against the cold it signified kind of who they were as a character and what part of the universe they belong to um and that was all, all very planned it was it was finding stuff in charity shops it was finding stuff we get our hands on and then layering it and and adding a you know adding the character's personality to that when it's the characters who work for the the corporation we we wanted to create a very distinct style for them with different insignia and different logos so they all felt like they were part of the same faction and then we wanted the main characters to really pop with their outfits and you know whether that's the main character's coat which is you know he wears for most of the film and that kind of becomes iconic to him um or it's he the, has got a good look about him hasn't he Mo? yeah he's, he's good he really has a presence and i think that's you know part of like the costume and the performance yeah. and i think it all works together to kind of give him a presence in the film um and also zoe played played by Yasmin alice like um her character has a robot arm so we wanted to design the costume so we could add the effects on afterwards and we could see it for some of the film um so when when she's introduced you can see a robot arm and the costume is is showing that um and that, and that that's just kind of telling the audience that straight out the gate. So that was all kind of considered when we were when we were dressing people for the villain Myrmidon. We wanted him to have like a, a, a Ronin mask and have this kind of cyberpunk cloak and body armor because we wanted him to appear as a threat. So it's the same sort of thing. Like as soon as this character is introduced, we're showing the audience through the costume as well as all the other things like performance and soundtrack and all that thing to really um, to really hammer home like who they are, what they're about, who who they align with and, and, and stuff like that. One of the most impressive things after the directing, of course, is... And the writing. And the writing. And the, and the locations. I was only about There's quite a few fight scenes in the film and a lot of them are very long takes, one take, you know, shots, obviously choreographed with stunts and choreographing the the fight scenes this is a two-parter a was that a challenge and b is that something that you always knew that's how you wanted it to play out as a as a long take fight rather than typically where fights are very quick pace quick cut so you can hide around you know the punches and things like that is that something that you wanted or is it maybe something that ben wanted to incorporate in the film or is that how you'd always seen it from writing the script um it's both so um I'll talk about the other fight scenes first, and then I'll talk about the Wanna because the Wanna is 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 kind of we approach that separately. A lot of the fight scenes I'd written in the script, and I wouldn't do this again. And this is something that I, I did when I wrote the script. Uh, yeah, you know, I've many years ago, and I wouldn't. You know, I've learned from this now. But I wrote down exactly what I wanted to happen in the fight scenes in the script, so I could look at the script on on set and be like. I've written that this person throws this punch and I can kind of remember how I saw it in my head. So, yeah. you know, that was very, it was very dense and we ended up throwing nearly all of that out the window because we turned up on location. We didn't have any time to do any rehearsals. Um, we rehearsed on location, but we didn't have any block time beforehand to do rehearsals. So it was very much like, this is how the fight's going to go. And I'd work with the people who came and did stunts with us and the cast and uh, Ben, the DOP, to, to figure out how the puzzle was gonna gonna work so the long takes were out of necessity because i would have loved the time to really do individual shots and figure stuff out but i didn't know enough then and also we were really pressed for time um because we'd be doing we'd be doing two locations and then the third location was the fight scene and, and it was just a, a bit of a logistical puzzle to to fix so um but the the one was separate 
the one was always planned as a single take and some of that changed depending on the location you know we'd look at this corridor that we had and we're like right how are we going to make this work how are we going to move into the next sequence out because it's a stitched together one it was about where where we're going to transition and and how how are these things going to flow so that that was an interesting challenge as well and with that we couldn't light we couldn't light it because mm-hmm. it was it was big you know there's these these small spaces but long takes moving through them and it was it was really figuring out the choreography knowing where the start and the end point was and then making sure that all the camera movement was motivated we didn't want to do any unmotivated you know pans or, or so sort of, random whip pan into the next shot yeah, yeah yeah it needed to all flow i really wanted this whole the whole wanna sequence to be like this is the mission this is where it starts and this is where it ends and we're kind of moving through the audience is moving through with the characters as they're kind of doing this kind of impossible mission but that was always meant to be a single take um I, you know when i wrote the script i was like right i want to do a one take fight scene and this is where it's going to be um and it was always built around that would I'll, you do it again i wanna yeah yes i would i think a lot of people do single take stuff and i would do it again but i think it has to serve a purpose yeah um and that's that's a, something else that you know i when we made this film i you know, I'm talking about motivated, uh, motivated camera movement. I'm talking about like practicals and set. Like I wanted, I feel like all of that stuff really does ground it. And uh, a, a wanna does sometimes run the risk of being flashy for the sake of it. And I, I want to make sure that if if that was something we were going to do again, the projects have to be right, the scene would have to be right. It'd have to really play into the to the audience's immersion. So, um, so yeah. So who did you get on for stunts, and how did you find them? Because when I kind of noticed the the quality of the fight scenes, I think really was it was I think the first fight with Mo and Myrmidon, and Mo kind of gets hit a bit, and then you come in with this somersault kick from Myrmidon. I was like, oh shit, yeah, like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. that was, that was impressive, cool. yeah, because I just didn't see it coming. And like, so was that a stunt guy? Was that an actor? Who was that? Yeah, so Myrmidon is a character who is. Um, physically portrayed by perry flowers and he has a gymnastics martial arts background i worked with him on the short film he came down with a friend of his called dan and they were a real integral part of the short film um just uh, subbing in for the stunts and helping us kind of figure it out i wanted the villain to have this kind of real physical presence and feel different to to mo physically the way in the fight scenes so that was kind of a no-brainer it was like let's let's have uh, the villain the real threat be someone who's precise acrobatic really skilled and then and then mo the main character is kind of more of a brawler so i wanted those two characters to feel differently and that that, that is kind of how we played into to that particular character and he's really keen to suggest different you know, moves he can do and, and and how he can kind of get involved in the scenes Who, whose idea was the somersault kick then is that something you kind of imagined or is that perry saying you, you know i could just do this you know <laughs> <laughs> like or did he just say i yeah, we could do this. And you're like, oh, fuck yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah. It was a case of getting there on the day and talking to Perry and saying, how, what do you, what can you do? Yeah. And what would work well for this? And kind of working with him and working with Sean, who plays Mo, to kind of make sure that that sort of sequence worked and told the story. That was, that was, for that particular scene, that is what I wanted. I wanted to really showcase kind of this character's power. So yeah, it was, it was collaborative with, with Perry. Perry would be like, oh, I can throw this sort of kick and come down this way. And I was like, like yes, please. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. We'll try that. And then he'd show us some options and then, you know, we'd kind of pick the best one and, and work, kind of work a bit, a bit kind of loosely with that and just kind of see what worked. That must be an exciting way to do it where it's just like laying out the options of what you can do in a yeah. fight. And like choosing a character in a game. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. can do. I want that I one. <laughs> so so what, we'd, what we'd do is me and Ben and sometimes Steffi, who was our AC, um, we'd walk through the scene and figure out what was going to happen and where we wanted people to go. Look at the script, look at what I'd written down and, and, and kind of figure out what felt right. From experience, it's difficult to write it down really specifically on a page and then translate it into a space um, because you've got multiple people moving around. it. And, and it's stuff like, if Moe's punching henchman number one, what's henchman number two doing? Mm. Where's henchman number three? At what point does henchman number one who's been punched to the floor get back up and come back in um so there is nothing worse than when you see in a film and like you see henchman number three just be like going like yeah my, my wait in a minute and then it goes in <laughs> yeah like, and, I, and i think our film is a bit guilty of that in some places i think there's a couple of times where you can see just the timing isn't quite right and you see it everywhere though. i saw a little bit of it in john wick four the other day there was one where they're kind of just waiting to get hit yeah, yeah. 
when we did the sequence uh, towards the end of the film where um, Moe's fighting the Marines in, in the kind of the simulated forest, we filmed that in a paintball site. I was going to ask where that was because I was like, yeah. as a location, that is meant. So that's in, that's in Bawtree. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. Yeah, near, near Donny. Yeah. Um, but they, yeah, so it's, a, it's you know, they had like Humvees and APCs and the, and the Black Hawk helicopter. So that's all just, yeah. It was it's just all... the crates that are just like, yep. it's yep. the little touches. that When I watched that, I was like, if they've built that from scratch, that is incredible yeah, like, no, operation because it looks so good. But it was for... perfect. It yeah. was perfect for what we wanted. And, and, the, and Is it a plane that's like a... It's a helicopter. Is it a yeah, helicopter? it's a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. And... Was it not covered in different colored paint everywhere though? If you if you look very closely, you can see some paint, but thank <laughs> thankfully the the it had kind of this mossy, rusty kind of look. You don't see it; doesn't stand out to you. But when we were there, their shop was open and they had smoke grenades. So none of the smoke stuff in that final sequence was planned, and we were like, that "Well, ben, ben in particular was like, should we drop twenty quid on some smoke grenades?" And worth it. That's yeah. that's <laughs> oh yeah yeah. So so all those fight scenes didn't have any smoke in them, and then yeah, we brought the smoke grenades in. And if you actually like think about it in the film, it doesn't make that much sense. <laughs> but, but it just, looks but it yeah, looks, it, looks so it cool. works yeah. really well, and it helps tie the kind of the fight scene together when they move around the helicopter we have the smoke that's consistent so it does it, it adds something to it yeah. um, which and it, and and I, and I think that works particularly well because and that's what i said about collaborating with people and um, that's a suggestion that ben had we appreciate you're the director and not the dp yep. you're not yeah. ben um could you tell us a little bit for the camera nerds out there you know what it was if you know what camera it was shot on um and lenses and maybe stylistic choice behind ben's cinematography yeah so we shot on the black magic ursa mini pro so it's the one that shoots 4.6k mm-hmm. and we filmed it in black magic raw which had just been released at that point so you, you shot it in black magic raw 4.6k yeah Jesus Christ! Yeah. Um, How much you spend on hard drives? <laughs> well, that that was that was where some of the budget went. When we scaled it up to feature, I was like, "What sort of infrastructure do we need to mm. actually be able to do this?" And that sort of digital space and making the backups. So I think I've got three copies of the film in different locations yeah. on four terabyte hard four three four terabyte hard drives. So it was quite. Oh, a, that's not bad. That's yeah, right. it was yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah. maybe it wasn't four point six k. Maybe it was just four k then. But we shot it in raw. Still, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lenses. What did you What did you shoot on? Can you remember what you shot? Yeah, they're Samyang Cine Prime. Okay. Yeah. So we shot more. Yeah. So we used all prime lenses. Um, a lot of the footage, and I might be wrong on this, but I'm I'm pretty sure we used a lot of 35 millimeter and 24 millimeter. You thought 50, didn't you? When we were setting up. Yeah. Nice. I think I, th- I think a lot of the closes we did we did a bit wider we did on thirty five yeah and then we shot the wides on twenty four the fight scene in the helicopter uh, the climax of the film that was sixteen right okay. we shot that on sixteen we shot that super wide I think. yeah is that just to get more of the environment in yeah. show the yeah. landscape off yeah yeah and 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 I, and I like a wide fight scene I like kind of showing it but um but that that's kind of what our approach was and was this single camera or did you have two cameras three cameras. Uh, single cam or single cam um and some of this comes back to how i wanted to approach scenes for this film um so when planning this film i wanted to approach the scenes you know individually and then as part of the larger film um so i really wanted to pay attention to the actors the performance how the scenes felt how people would move around in the scenes and 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 make sure the scenes individually worked as well as they possibly could be um, performance wise and story wise so ben kind of lit the scenes and then we did the singles um, and that way we could really give the time and attention to you know those those things we do classic wide mids close-ups so it, you know it would be like that we'd let the scene play in a couple of wides and then we'd go in and do the close-ups which did take more time than if we'd done it multi-cam but we only had budget for one you know, one camera um we didn't have budget for any cam like any any real kit hire so a lot of it was just stuff that people had and, and we could borrow and stuff you mentioned to me just while the cameras weren't rolling that everything was shot handheld yes what was the thought process behind doing that so on day one, we thought about doing some of it tripod, and then we decided very quickly that we wanted to just scrap that and go handheld for the whole film. So there's two tracking shots in it, and then there's some steady cam stuff, but the rest of the film, all the all the closes, all the wides, mm. um, except for one shot, I think, where we knew we were gonna 
have to comp a lot of shots together into one. We wanted to kind of make make it as realistic as possible. And, and part of that was choosing this kind of real kinetic, handheld, kind of shaky cam feel because we wanted to put people right in there and really immerse them. I um, can't imagine those action scenes shot on a tripod or just a slider going past them while they're, you know, knocking 10 ton of shit out of each other. Like it, it works for handheld. It yeah. adds that energy. And that's what we did with Among the Living. We kind of, we decided early on, didn't we, that handheld was the way forward for that world. Um, but then also from a logistical point of view, we knew we could get through so much more with the handheld. Yeah. Not that we use that as its prime, the primary reason why we shot handheld, but it worked. But it is a factor. It's, it's a compromise and it's figuring out like, how can we make the most most with what we've got? Um, and and those sequences in in Among the Living that are shot handheld, the chase sequences through the woods and stuff work really well. And it and it is about it's the same thing. It's about putting people in there, making making people feel the the scene and 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 feel the not in a not in an unmotivated way, but it's about putting people in there and and, and having them feel some of the energy and adrenaline, the, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Did you get any complaints from the VFX guys though, that everything was handheld? Because it must have made it way harder for them. <laughs> I didn't get any complaints. Um, <laughs> you just forwarded them on to <laughs> It's time now for... We've not got a name for it yet, have we? No, we're going to dub it in. Yeah. For every guest we have on the show, we ask for your top five films. And then we will rate them in a particular way using... Combination of five. Herbs and spices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, have you brought your top five films with you? I have. Yeah. Okay. Let's start. Start number five. At number five. Can you remind me what my top five? Was? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, you're hiding the illusion, Ed. <laughs> number five. Is, I can't wait to hear what number five is. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, Escape from New York. Okay. Nice. Okay. I'm gonna search that in. <laughs> okay. Got it. Number four is Mandy. Oh, I'm still with, not seeing that. Nick Cage. Yeah, it's, it's decent. I'll search it. <laughs> Number three. Number three is Grease. Grease. That's such an odd... That didn't expect Grease. I feel like... Oh, will that have a lot of ratings or not? I mean, it's I a very say, popular film, isn't it? Yeah, but it's whether people have chose to rate it. Like, yeah, I reckon it's... Yeah. Number two. So number two is Blade 2. Okay. Blade 2. Oh, have I, have I, have I messed two. up there? No. I can Google it. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, I do need to search that one. And, I mean, to be fair, it makes no difference because like, the ranking makes no difference. But what's your number one? Uh, my my number one is uh, Blade Runner 2049. So. I've not seen it. Have you seen the interview <laughs> with bad, uh, Alison Hammond? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so it's good, really it? funny. It's Whenever really it pops funny. up on my feed, I'm like, I have to watch it in yeah. full. That's a... That's a Good mix. Mm, yeah. Why is played on the twenty forty nine at the top? I think why is greased. <laughs> <laughs> That's my important question. Twenty forty nine is at the top because um, I originally it would have been the original Blade Runner, but when I watched twenty forty nine in the cinema, I just was really blown away by how it took my then favorite film and then expanded upon it and and kind of. Um, moved everything on 20 years i just think it's a it's a really stellar sequel it's a bit like what we were talking about with top gun wasn't it like yeah. now it's a modernized version of it and yeah i get yeah. that so basically what we do is we'll take your films and we'll see rather than the rating it has we calculate the amount of ratings calculate it <laughs> we read <laughs> read <laughs> it's written on imd um, <laughs> yeah we will read and put it into a formula and I'll work yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, we'll, don't yeah, worry about yeah. it. We'll work out what, you know, your total amount and basically the total amount of ratings for all your five films. So not the rating itself, but the number of ratings it's received will determine how mainstream or niche your top five favourite films are. So what's the goal? Is the goal to be... Low as, number. Low, low number. Yeah, you want to be in the sub-million club with... You, you, oh, yeah, you, you can say that because you're under a mill. Yeah, John's definitely not. So number five. Number five, Escape from New York. We've got 148,000. Good start. Decent, decent score. Number five, that's good. What was after that? Mandy, 83,000. That's a, that's a solid score. Yeah. Greece, 285,000, which it's not bad, actually. No. Blade 2, 224,000. This, depending on Blade Runner. What's your betting for the Blade Runner 2049 ratings? How many times oh. have you been rating? 
Because this is make or break for if you're in the is, sub milk yeah. club. I say six hundred thousand ratings. Five hundred ninety-five thousand. Oh, that was close. Oh, what a guess! It's so a total uh, in one point three three five million. That's not bad. Too bad, though. It's pretty good. Yeah, I'm happy well with that. Well played. Beaten Jord. Yeah. To fair, we've only done, we've only done like four or five. Times. Oh, right. Okay, that makes me feel better. I'm in the top eighty percent. But yeah, well played. That's a good score, I'd say. Well played. Thanks. Yeah, well played. Thank you. So the film's probably out now on streaming, where people can find it. What was the process of getting it out there and getting it distributed? So I looked at films of a similar budget and a similar genre and then kind of worked from there. So um, I did quite a bit of research into figuring out who I wanted to approach. And it was looking at what other distributors had, had distributed and what sort of films they represented and how many they they put out and, and trying to just figure out who would work best for the film. So there's a couple, a couple of people I approached and uh, eventually we went with Real to Real Films, um, and it's been a good experience working with them. It was just about me approaching people and trying to feel my way through that process because I've never done it before. So it was it was just about figuring out what's best for the film and and them figuring out if the film was right for them and stuff like that. So um, it yeah, it, it wasn't a you know no one approached me saying I want to buy your film. I, I had to kind of put some feelers out there. And then just kind of see how it how it progressed. I'm guessing that your intention to making a feature was to you know eventually get distribution and then see what happens from that. But yeah, how did it feel when you initially secured that? So what I wanted out of making a feature was just for the feature to be better than the last film we made. So I had no expectations, no real expectations. Um, there was always this idea that oh maybe you know I could get my budget back or maybe it could end up going straight onto Amazon or something. And I, I didn't really know. So, you know, back in 2019 when we shot it, I had no idea where the film was going. It was just this kind of idea that it will get released in some form. And as long as it's better than the last film I've made, I'd be happy, um, which is better than the last film I've made. I'm really proud of how the film's turned out. And I am I think it's, you know, so I've achieved, I've achieved that. The idea of getting it distributed and working with a distributor, I hadn't really put any much, any stock into thinking about that. It was really, really nice when all that sort of came through. Um, that was really validating that all this work was kind of paying off in this way, um, even though that wasn't something that that I'd ever really considered um, that it would get distributed in this way. Um, so that that was really nice. But the, but the real relief and when it really hit me was when we posted the hard drive to the distributor with the final master on it. Yeah, that was when it the the weight was really lifted and it really I really was like, yep, yeah, this is this is done now. Like yeah. you know, the film exists, it's out there now. I can't do anything about it. I can't change those two little things that I noticed since I did the final export. Like they're out there now. It's it's done. Um, so um, that was when it really hit me. I think. I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. So thanks a lot for coming on this podcast. I keep calling it a show. Um, I feel like Graham Norton now. We've just been like, make sure to watch Future Soldier <laughs> um, wherever it may be available to watch. But yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking through how the process was for you, what you've learned, and hopefully for everyone listening or watching, they can take from what you've spoken about and, you know, if they and use that in their own films or projects moving forward or you might have inspired someone else to become a director so um yeah cheers for coming on no thanks for thanks for having me it's been really good to kind of talk it through with you guys and um i hope what i've said can be useful to somebody definitely yeah check it out it's a future soldier written and directed by ed kirk out on streaming now yeah probably now if not a couple of days time but probably now <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah thanks as always for listening to the podcast uh, or watching us if you're uh, on YouTube. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. You look nice. And yeah, we'll see you on the next one. See you later. See ya. See you later. We didn't do social media shout outs, do we think we need to? We can just do, we've got we a call out title. Just yeah. slap it over the top. Yeah, yeah fuck it.